So we're going to be continuing with chapter 17 for blood. This is the second part. Uh, please be sure to view the first part if you haven't done so already. And as always, be sure to subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so. Give this video a thumbs up if you like it. And also, if you have any questions, comments, leave in the comments area below or email me directly. We're going to be starting off with leukocytes, which is another name for white blood cells or WBCs. These are the only formed elements that are complete cells. In other words, they have a nuclei and organelles. They make up less than 1% of the total blood volume. So the ranges we see for white blood cells are about 4,800 to 10,800 white blood cells per microliter of blood. Our body's main defense mechanism are leukocytes. So a white blood cell's job is to defend our body against all kinds of microorganisms. They are able to leave the blood capillaries by a process called diapedesis. Once they leave the blood vessel and enter the tissue, they form flowing cytoplasmic extensions that move them along. And this is called an amoeboid motion. They're able to pinpoint areas of infection and damaged tissue by following chemical trails of molecules that are released by other white blood cells or damaged tissue by a phenomenon known as positive chemotaxis. The term leukocytosis refers to a white blood cell count of over 11,000 cells per microliter of blood. And this is a normal response as your body is responding to something that it thinks is not supposed to be there. It's an immune response to protect you against infections from pathogens. Leukocytes are grouped into two major categories based on their appearance. After staining blood and looking at it under the microscope, you're going to see the appearance of granules in the cytoplasm of some cells which are called the granulocytes, and other cells will have an absence of granules, which are called the agranulocytes. There are two types of agranulocytes and three types of granulocytes, which we'll be looking at. And here's a mnemonic that will help you remember the order of different types of white blood cells going from highest to lowest in abundance. Never let monkeys eat bananas. The N stands for neutrophils, the L stands for lymphocytes, the M stands for monocytes, E stands for eosinophils, and the B stands for basophils. So in this slide here, you can see here on the left side are all of the formed elements. We have red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. And of the white blood cells, we have a normal range anywhere from 4,800 to 10,800 cells per microliter of blood. And they're divided into granulocytes and agranulocytes, which is based on the presence or absence of any visible granules in their cytoplasm. Of the granulocytes, we have the neutrophils, which are the most numerous of the white blood cells and are found in the range of anywhere between 50 to 70% of all white blood cells. Next, we have the eosinophils, which account for about 2 to 4%. And finally, we have the basophils, which account for about one half to 1% of all white blood cells. Moving along to the agranulocytes, we have the lymphocytes, which account for anywhere from 25 to 45% of all white blood cells while the monocytes account for 3 to 8%. So let's start off by looking at the granulocytes. As mentioned in the previous slide, we have three types of granulocytes. The neutrophils, eosinophils, and the basophils. They're usually larger than red blood cells, but they have a shorter lifespan compared to them. They're all roughly spherical in shape and have a lobed nuclei rather than a circular one. Their cytoplasm stains specifically with right stain, which allows us to see the granules. And functionally, they're all phagocytic to some degree. Neutrophils are highly phagocytic cells. Initially, these are the principal cells fighting a bacterial infection, so they're sometimes referred to as bacteria slayers. These cells will increase in numbers very quickly during a bacterial infection. So if you look at a blood cell count and the neutrophil count is high, that means you have to find a bacterial infection somewhere. The microbes are killed by a process called respiratory burst. What happens is that the oxygen gets metabolized to produce bleach and hydrogen peroxide and defensin-mediated lysis occurs. Also, when the granules containing defensin are merged with the microbe containing phagosomes, the defensins form these peptide spares, which pierce holes in the membrane of the ingested microbe. Let's start off here on the left. We have a neutrophil, eosinophil, and a basophil. Collectively, these three are known as polymorphonuclear granulocytes. So these three here, you can see the granules over here, over there, and over here, which is why they are referred to as granulocytes. The next two over here, we have the agranulocytes, and these are the lymphocyte and the monocytes. So this here is a neutrophil. You can see this is larger than the red blood cells, which you see surrounding neutrophils over here. And in this case, we can see a three-lobed nucleus. And you can also see this lilac color here in the cytoplasm, which is indicative of the very fine granules that are present. Eosinophils get their name from the acid dye eosin that these cells pick up when we stain blood. They account for roughly 2-4% to of all white blood cells and are the main cells that respond to allergies and parasites, most importantly, worms. 
They're easily distinguished as their nucleus has two lobes which is connected by a broad band of nuclear material. The entire nucleus resembles analog telephones from the 70s and 80s or even earmuffs. The lysosome-like granules are filled with a unique variety of digestive enzymes which are effective against parasites instead of bacteria. These cells reside in the loose connective tissue of the respiratory mucosa and intestines where parasitic worms are usually found. Once they find their target, these cells surround the parasite and release the enzymes from the cytoplasmic granules onto the surface of these worms which digest them away. And as I mentioned earlier, they also have a role in allergies and asthma in addition to being important modulators in the immune response. And in this slide here you can see the eosinophil and you can very clearly see the granules which are stained this pinkish red color. And here we have its two lobe nucleus which is connected by this band right over here that's full of nuclear material. Moving on to the basophils, these are the rarest of the white blood cells, accounting for only a half to 1% of all leukocytes. It gets its name because these cells will stain with the basic dye. Again, when you look at this term basophil, phil means loving and baso refers to this dye, the basic dye. So basophil, loving that basic dye. For eosinophils, the dye it loved was eosin, so it was named eosinophil. And for the neutrophils, remember that they pick up both dyes, so they are neutral, hence the name neutrophil. Back to the basophils, these cells are very dark staining, so dark that it's hard to see the nucleus. When you find the nucleus and you look at it carefully, you'll see that it's usually either a U or S in shape with a single or dual constriction. Their cytoplasm contains these large, coarse histamine-containing granules. Histamine acts as a vasodilator and attracts white blood cells to inflamed sites. And remember, inflammation is the body's general response to an attack or injury. So think of what happens when you have a sports injury after pitching nine innings in a baseball game, or maybe you twist an ankle stealing a base. What happens to the site of injury? You have pain, redness, swelling, and warmth. These are all cardinal signs of inflammation. Functionally, basophils are similar to mast cells, which are also granulated cells that we find in deep connective tissue. They both bind to immunoglobulin E, which causes the cells to release histamines. But they differ in the shape of their nuclei, which tends to be more oval, and they arise from a different cell line. And this slide here, we're looking at a basophil. So right away, you can notice that this is a very dark staining cell. And you can see the granules, again, they're dyed this purple black color. And also we have a bilobe nucleus that's present. And you can see there is a single constriction. Uh, and here we see the red blood cells that are surrounded by and we have a platelet right over here. Moving on to the agranulocytes. Remember, these cells lack any visible cytoplasmic granules. We have two types which are the lymphocytes and monocytes. And they both have either a spherical or kidney shaped nuclei that's visible. After the neutrophils, Lymphocytes are the second most numerous of the white blood cells as they account for at least 25% but going up to as much as 45% of all white blood cells. They have a giant spherical nucleus which is sometimes slightly indented. It stains purple and accounts for most of the cell's volume, leaving a small area of free cytoplasm which you can see as a thin blue rim. They range in size from small to large. The small cell's diameters range from 5 to 8 micrometers, medium cells are 10 to 12 micrometers, and the large cells are in the order of 14 to 17 micrometers in diameter. We're not sure what significance the size of these white blood cells are, but we do know that during acute viral infections and some immunodeficiency disorders, we see an increase in the number of the large cells. They're found in blood vessels but in small quantities. The majority of these cells, as the name implies, reside in lymph tissue, so you have a high concentration of them in the spleen and lymph nodes where they're key players in immunity. As to the type of lymphocytes, Depending on the textbook you're reading and who you're talking to, you'll get an answer of either 2 or 3. So while this textbook states 2, others will say 3. I'll go over all 3 of them, but don't worry too much about this now. When you get to the chapter on the immune system, you'll have a better understanding at that point. Listed here we have T cells and B cells. The one that's not listed here is the natural killer cells or the NK cells as they're known by their acronym. T cells or T lymphocytes function by directly attacking virus infected cells, fungi, tumor or cancer cells, in addition to some bacteria. They're also responsible for transfusion reactions as well as rejection of transplanted organs. The B lymphocytes or the B cells give rise to plasma cells which produce antibodies. B cells are very effective in destroying bacteria and inactivating their toxins. As for the natural killer cells, they account for about 5-10% to of the lymphocytes. Natural killer cells will attack a wide variety of infectious microbes in addition to any body cell that displays abnormal or unusual plasma membrane proteins. 
Natural killer cells bind to their target cell and release granules containing toxic substances that destroy the cell. And in this slide over here, we're looking at a lymphocyte. And this is a small lymphocyte, which is surrounded by red blood cells. And here you can see some platelets. Now, notice the largest part of this cell is the nucleus. And here's a slight indentation. And you can see this thin blue rim that's left of the cytoplasm. Monocytes are the largest of all white blood cells with an average cell diameter of about 18 micrometers. They account for about 3 to 8% of all WBCs. They have a large blue cytoplasm and a dark purple staining nucleus which ranges from a U or kidney shape in structure. Monocytes leave the bloodstream and enter the tissue where they differentiate into highly motile macrophages. When you look at this term here, macrophage, macro means big or large and phage means to eat. So these are big eaters or as they say it over here, they're actively phagocytic cells. These are very important cells as they're crucial to the body's defense against viruses, intercellular bacterial parasites, and chronic infections like TB. They're also important in activating lymphocytes to monitor an immune response. In this slide here, we're looking at a monocyte. So the first thing you'll notice is that there are no granules present, which is why this is termed an agranulocyte. Next thing you'll notice is this U-shaped nucleus. Also, you can see this pale blue area here, which shows this large cytoplasm. So in this slide over here, we can see all the agranulocytes over on this end and the granulocytes over here on the left side. So when you look at neutrophils, the first thing we notice is that it has a multi-lobed nucleus. The next thing we notice is that the granules, they're stained both red and pink compared to the eosinophil over here where the granules are all stained this reddish to orange color. And then we, the other thing we notice at the eosinophil is, this, is that it has a bilobed nucleus. When we move on to the basophil, it's only stained, the granules are stained over here, this dark purplish to black. And then also we notice that the nucleus is very hard to distinguish, it's very hard to see because it's so darkly stained. But notice that it is bilobed and it has a single constriction that we can see over here. Uh, moving on to the agranulocytes, we have the lymphocyte and we'll notice that the lymphocyte takes up most of the space of this cell. It takes up most of the cell volume. And it leaves this slight, this small rim that we see here, this blue colored, uh, which is the remainder of the cytoplasm. When you move on to the monocyte, again, when you look at the nucleus over here, it has this U-shaped. And again, this has a much more, this is a much larger cell. So we have a lot more room for the cytoplasm that's visible over here. Moving on to the production and lifespan of leukocytes, when you look at this term leukopoiesis, leuco means white and poiesis means formation or production of. So this term leukopoiesis means the production of white blood cells, which is similar to when we looked at the term for red blood cell production, which was erythropoiesis. So now we have leukopoiesis. Leukopoiesis is stimulated by chemical messengers that are glycoproteins, which fall into two hematopoietic factors interleukins and colony stimulating factors or CSFs as they're known by their acronym. Both of these chemicals are released by supporting cells of the red bone marrow and mature white blood cells. These chemicals also enhance the protective potency of mature leukocytes. The different types of interleukins are numbers such as interleukin 3 or interleukin 5. The colony stimulating factors are named for the leukocyte types that they stimulate. So granulocyte colony stimulating factor will stimulate the production of granulocytes. All of the white blood cells start off as hemocytoblast stem cells, which branch off into either lymphoid stem cells that produce the lymphocytes, or myeloid stem cells, which produce the remaining white blood cells, in addition to the platelets and red blood cells. We're going to look at a diagram after a couple of slides, which will illustrate these steps. So pay attention now, and it'll be a good review when we get to that illustration. So for the granulocytes, the hemopoietic stem cell gives rise to a myeloid stem cell. The myeloid stem cell will form into a myeloblast. Next, the myeloblast will start accumulating lysosomes and turns into a promyelocyte. When the distinctive granules appear, the cell is termed a myelocyte, and also at this point is when the cell division is complete. The next thing that happens is that the nucleus arcs, and it's at this point the cell is termed a band cell. Next, what happens is right before granulocytes leave the bone marrow, the nuclei constrict and become segmented before it enters blood circulation. Our bone marrow stores 10 times more granulocytes than we find in circulating blood. Our body produces three times more white blood cells than red blood cells due to the white blood cells having a very short lifespan because of their job fighting off pathogens. As for the agranulocytes, the monocytes are derived from the myeloid line as we saw on the previous slide. The hemopoietic stem cell returns to a myeloid stem cell which turns into a monoblast. 
The monoblast turns into a promonocyte, which then leaves the bone marrow and then turns into a monocyte. They share a common precursor with neutrophils and can live for several months. The lymphocytes are derived from the lymphoid line, so a hemopoietic stem cell will give rise to a lymphoid stem cell, which will turn into either a T lymphocyte precursor or a B lymphocyte precursor. In the case of the T lymphocyte precursor, these cells will leave the bone marrow and travel to the thymus gland where they will mature. The B lymphocyte precursors remain immature within the bone marrow. The lymphocytes will live anywhere from a few hours to decades. So this slide is a nice illustration of what we learned in the past couple of slides. So let's start off over here on the top. So what we have over here is this hematopoietic stem cell, which will differentiate into either a myeloid stem cell or a lymphoid stem cell. In the case of it becoming a myeloid stem cell, it has a fate of either turning into any one of the three granulocytes or a monocyte. And in the case of it differentiating into a lymphoid stem cell, then it's going to turn into either a T or a B lymphocyte. Now, let's go off over here. So if it turns into a myeloid stem cell, what's going to happen is that it's going to turn into either a myeloblast or a monoblast. Now, let's go with the case of it turning into a myeloblast because when it turns into a myeloblast, when it differentiates into a myeloblast, it's going to end up be becoming any one of these granulocytes. Okay, this eosinophil, basophil, and neutrophil. So this myeloid stem cell, it ends up differentiating into a myeloblast, and at this point, it starts to accumulate lysosomes. When it starts to accumulate the lysosomes, it then differentiates into a promyelocyte. Now what's going on over here is this. This cell will then start to accumulate granules. When the granules appear, when it becomes evident, then we call that a myelocyte. Okay, so in this case, this is an eosinophilic myelocyte, in this case here, it's a basophilic myelocyte or a neutrophilic myelocyte. At this point also is when the cell will stop dividing, okay? And then next thing that happens is that when you look at the nucleus, it starts to arc. When we see that, we call that a band cell. So in this case, it's an eosinophilic band cell. In this case here, it's a basophilic band cell. Or in this case here, it's a neutrophilic band cell. At this point, what's going to happen is that these cells will then leave the bone marrow, and at that point, right before it's leaving the bone marrow actually, the nucleus will constrict, as you can see over here, and it starts to segment. Uh, so again, and at, at that point is when we call it an eosinophil, a basophil, or a neutrophil. It's after the nucleus constricts and it segments, and then it will enter the bloodstream. Now, moving on to this myelo stem cell, if it differentiates into a monoblast. What happens is that this monoblast will then differentiate into a promonocyte. Then this promonocyte will differentiate, it will leave the bone marrow, and then it ends up becoming a monocyte. And some of these monocytes end up becoming macrophages, which reside in the tissue. The other thing that can happen is that this hematopoietic stem cell can differentiate into a lymphoid stem cell. If it differentiates into a lymphoid stem cell, this cell can then either differentiate into a B lymphocyte precursor or a T lymphocyte precursor. Both of these cells are committed cells, meaning that they cannot differentiate into anything else. Now, if we're looking at a T lymphocyte precursor, this cell is going to leave the red bone marrow and travel to the thymus gland, where it matures into a T lymphocyte. And some of these T lymphocytes will end up becoming effector T cells. Now, if the lymphoid stem cell differentiates into a B lymphocyte precursor, it is going to stay in the red bone marrow, where it ends up maturing into a B lymphocyte. And some of these B lymphocytes will end up differentiating into plasma cells. The clinical significance of many of these hematopoietic hormones such as erythropoietin and colony stimulating factors are quite significant. It can stimulate the bone marrow of cancer patients that are receiving chemotherapy or stem cell transplants. So remember, when individuals are receiving chemotherapy, not only are the bad cells being destroyed, but also the good, the healthy tissue ends up being destroyed as well. So in these individuals, when we, when we administer these hormones to them, they end up getting more white blood cells being produced, more red blood cells being produced. Now let's look at some leukocyte disorders. There could be overproduction of abnormal white blood cells, and the two that we're going to be looking at are the leukemias and infectious mononucleosis. Now there can also be abnormally low white blood cell count, and that term is leukopenia. So again, when you look at this word leukopenia, Luc means white, pina means deficient, so not enough or deficiency of white cells. Another term, if you may recall, erythropenia, that's for low red blood cell count. Now, leukopenia could be a result of 
certain drugs. So uh, if you're looking at anti-cancer drugs or some steroids like glucocorticoids, they can suppress the formation of white blood cells. Leukemias are a cancerous condition involving the overproduction of abnormal white blood cells. And it usually starts off with a single cell that ends up cloning itself over and over and over and over again. So now what ends up happening is you have all these bad useless cells that are in your system. And they're named according to the abnormal white blood cell clone that's involved. So if you're looking at a myeloid leukemia, it involves myeloblasts. If you're looking at lymphocytic leukemias, you're looking at lymphocytes that are involved. A leukemia is said to be acute or quickly advancing if it's derived from stem cells. And it usually affects children. Now, if the leukemia is slowly advancing, it's said to be chronic and it involves proliferation of later cell stages. And this is usually more prevalent in older people. Without treatment, all of the leukemias are fatal. The immature non-functional white blood cells, they're flooding the bloodstream. But remember, they're useless. These cells cannot do anything. They're just taking up space, doing nothing. So these cancerous cells, they fill up the red bone marrow and they start crowding out the other cell lines. So now you can't have uh, enough red blood cells being produced. You can't have enough platelets being produced. So what ends up happening? you end up becoming anemic and you start to bleed internally. And again, death is usually from internal bleeding, internal hemorrhages or infections, overwhelming infections. Because what's happening is, as I said earlier, you have a lot of white blood cells, but they can't do their job. They're just there. They're, they can't function. They're non-functional cells. What are the treatment options? We have irradiation, anti-leukemic drugs, and stem cell transplants. Infectious mononucleosis, or mono, which is also known as a kissing disease, is a highly contagious viral disease that's caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. We usually see this in young adults, and it results in a high number of typical agranulocytes. It involves lymphocytes that become really big, they become enlarged. At one point, they actually thought these cells were monocytes, which is how they ended up getting this term mononucleosis, but then they found out, oh, these aren't monocytes, these are actually lymphocytes but the name mono stuck, stuck around, so they're called, it's been called mononucleosis. Now, what are the symptoms? You end up being very tired, you get aches, you get this chronic sore throat and low-grade fever. What's the cure? There is no cure. You just have to let it run its course, get rest, and four to six weeks later, it should be out of your system and you should have recovered. Moving on to the platelets, these are cytoplasmic fragments of a very large cell called the megakaryocyte. Their diameter is in the order of 60 micrometers. When looking at blood smears, the outer regions of the platelets will stain blue, while the inner areas are going to contain the purple staining granules, which act in the clotting process. And these granules contain an assortment of chemicals including serotonin, calcium, enzymes, ADP, and platelet-derived growth factors, or PDGF. And the normal range for platelets is anywhere from 150,000 to 400,000 platelets per microliter of blood. So this slide looks like a repeat of what we looked at in the previous slide. So let's just kind of skim through this real quickly. So we have platelets, which are fragments of megakaryocytes, and we stated that they're involved in the clotting process. They include several chemicals, including serotonin, calcium, ADP, PDGF. And again, so their function is to temporarily produce a plug, which is referred to as a platelet plug. And this seals any breaks in blood vessels. Circulating platelets, they're kept inactive and mobile by nitric oxide and prostacyclins. These chemicals are released from the endothelial cells lining the blood vessels. Platelet formation is regulated by the hormone thrombopoietin. So we start off with the hematopoietic stem cell, which differentiates into a myeloid stem cell. So platelets come from the myeloid line. Now this myeloid stem cell is going to differentiate into a megakaryoblast, which is also known as a stage 1 megakaryocyte. Now, this megakaryoblast is going to undergo mitosis several times, but no cytokinesis is going to take place. So, we end up going from a stage 1, and then to a stage 2, a stage 3. Then finally, we reach this really large cell with this multi-lobe nucleus, which is this stage 4 megakaryocyte. The stage 4 megakaryocytes will press themselves into special capillaries found within the red bone marrow called sinusoids. And what they're doing is that they're inserting their cytoplasm projections into the lumens of the capillaries. As these cytoplasm projections break off, the platelet fragments flow into the bloodstream, and the plasma membrane associated with each fragment quickly seeds itself around the cytoplasm, forming a disc-shaped platelet. A platelet's lifespan is quite short, as they age quickly and degenerate in about 10 days. So this slide here goes over what we discussed in the last slide. 
Now, not all the steps are illustrated, so let's just go over what they have illustrated for us. So we have this hematopoietic stem cell, which differentiates into this megakaryoblast, which is also known as a stage 1 megakaryocyte. Now, this cell will undergo mitosis several times without cytokinesis, leading to megakaryocyte, or stage 2 or stage 3, which eventually turns into a stage 4 megakaryocyte. Now, this stage 4 megakaryocyte, its cytoplasmic extensions, are going to cling on to the capillaries of the red bone marrow, and from there, as these extensions rupture, we end up getting these platelet fragments that end up flooding into the bloodstream. As they're flowing into the bloodstream, the plasma membrane ends up surrounding these fragments to form these dish-shaped platelets. This is a very good study table that you should be looking at. You should be using this to study for your exams, actually. So let's start off over here. We have the red blood cells or the erythrocytes. And as you move over, look at their description. They're biconcave in shape. They lack a nucleus. And as for, for their diameter, it's anywhere from 7 to 8 micrometers. Now, what's their normal range? Anywhere from 4 to 6 million cells per microliter of blood. They take about 15 days to develop, and their lifespan is anywhere from 100 to 120 days. What's their function? These guys tra are transporting the respiratory gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide. Moving on to the leukocytes or your white blood cells, these are spherical nucleated cells. And what's their count? Anywhere from 4,800 to 10,800 cells per microliter of blood. And remember, these leukocytes get broken up into or grouped into granulocytes and agranulocytes. So we're going to be starting with the granulocytes first. And those granulites are the neutrophils, eosinophils, and the basophils. When you look at the neutrophils, we see this multi-lobed nucleus. And the granules are staining both blue and or blue-purple and this pinkish-red color. And the diameter for the cell is anywhere from 10 to 12 micrometers. And they are in the order of anywhere from 3,000 to 7,000 cells per microliter of blood. And they take about 14 days to develop. And as far as their lifespan goes, anywhere from 6 hours to a few days. What do they do? What's their functions? They eat up bacteria. Moving on to the eosinophils. When you look at it, what do we have? We find this bilobed nucleus as present. And we can see that the granules, they're staining this reddish-orange color. Why? Because they take up the dye eosin. What's their diameter? Notice that they're larger than these guys over here. They're larger than neutrophils. So their diameter is about 10 to 14 micrometers. What's their count? Anywhere from 100 to 400 cells per microliter of blood. How long do they take to develop? These guys also take 14 days to develop, but their lifespan is about 5 days. Now, what do they do? These kill parasitic worms, and they play a complex role in allergy and asthma. Moving on to the basophils, when you look at it, this is a very dark staining cell, and it has a bilobed nucleus. Again, it's very hard to see, but you can see it over here, and it has a small constriction. Uh, the granules, they stain this dark purple color, and their diameter is about 10 to 14 micrometers. And as to their count, anywhere from 20 to 50 cells per microliter of blood. What's their lifespan? A few hours to a few days, and they take about 1 to 7 days for development. Now, their function is to release histamine and other mediators of inflammation. They also contain heparin, which is an anticoagulant. Moving on to the agranulocytes, we have lymphocytes and monocytes. And when you look at the lymphocytes, its nucleus is usually either spherical or slightly indented. The cytoplasm is usually thin, and it gets stained this light blue color. Again, the reason that this is a small cytoplasm that's visible is because the nucleus ends up taking most of the space. It's the diameter for this entire cell is anywhere from 5 to 17 micrometers, and we have a count, a range, that's anywhere from 1,500 to 3,000 cells per microliter of blood. As for the lifespan, anywhere from hours to years, and its development it could be from days to weeks. What do they do? They mount immune response by direct cell attack or via antibodies. Moving on to the monocytes. These are very large cells. These are the largest of all the white blood cells. So you look at their the diameter. It's anywhere from 14 to 24 micrometers in diameter. And when you look at the nucleus, it's either a U or a kidney shape. And they have a relatively large cytoplasm as well. Again, the reason being is because we were looking at a much larger cell. Uh, the cytoplasm is going to stain either a gray to bluish color. And what's their count? Anywhere from 100 to 700 cells per microliter of blood. What's their development cycle? Anywhere from 2 to 3 days. And their lifespan could be months. Their function is phagocytosis, so the development of these macrophages in the tissue. Moving on to the platelets, 
These are these disc-shaped fragments of this megakaryocyte that we discussed a few slides ago. And what's their diameter? These are very small, anywhere from 2 to 4 micrometers. As to their count, it's anywhere from 150,000 to 400,000 fragments per microliter of blood. As for their development, they take about 4 to 5 days to develop. And remember, their lifespan is usually around 10 days, so from 5 to 10 days. What do they do? They seal small tears in blood vessels, and they're very important in the blood clotting process. Moving on to hemostasis. When you look at the term hemostasis, stasis means staying still. Hem refers to blood, so blood standing still. And this is a fast series of chemical reactions for stoppage of bleeding. In other words, when you have a bleed, this is what happens to stop it. And it requires clotting factors and other substances that are released by platelets at the injured tissue. And there's three steps that are involved. Step one is the vascular spasm. Step two is platelet plug formation. And step three is coagulation or blood clotting. In the first step, we have vascular spasm. And what's happening here is that the vessel is responding to the injury by constricting. In other words, we have vasoconstriction taking place. The vascular spasm is triggered by direct injury to the vascular smooth muscle, chemicals that are released by endothelial cells and platelets, and reflexes which are initiated by local pain receptors. This is most effective in smaller blood vessels, and it can significantly reduce blood flow until other mechanisms kick in. So if you think about it, what's happening is that you have a hole in a vessel. And because you have a hole, what's happening to the blood? It's escaping. Now, if you think about it, if you have a large hole, what's going to happen? You're going to have a lot of blood going on. But if that hole gets small, then less blood will escape. So this is exactly what is, what's happening over here. This vessel, it's constricting, it's getting smaller, so not a lot of blood gets out. In other words, it's reducing the flow of blood outside of that vessel. Step two is the platelet plug formation. So when these vessels are damaged, collagen fibers are exposed. And as these platelets are swimming by, they end up sticking on to these exposed collagen fibers. When the blood vessels are not damaged, in other words, when you have intact vessel walls, the collagen fibers are not exposed, so the platelets are not able to stick onto them. Additionally, prostacyclins and nitric oxides are secreted by the endothelial cells that act to prevent these platelets from sticking onto this wall. A large plasma protein called von Willebrand factor stabilizes the bound platelets by forming a bridge between the collagen and platelets. When platelets become activated, they swell up, form spike processes, and become much more sticky. Additionally, they release the following chemical messengers. ADP, which stands for adenosine diphosphate, this is a potent aggregating agent that causes more platelets to stick to the area and release their contents. And then we have serotonin and thromboxane A2. This enhances the vascular spasm and platelet aggregation. As more platelets aggregate, they release more chemicals aggregating more platelets and on and on in a positive feedback cycle. While platelet plugs are fine for small tears in the vessels, it's not going to be enough for the larger tears, which will require additional steps. Alright, so now we move on to step 3, which is coagulation. Now, a lot of people have a problem with this, so let me kind of put this into simpler terms as to what's going on. So, let's just take a step back into what we learned in the past couple of slides. So, step 1, what happened? We had a hole, right, in the blood vessel, and that blood vessel, it constricted. Why? Well, think about it. When you have a hole, and, you know, there's, uh, if the hole is large, you have a lot of blood leaving through a larger hole. So if you make that hole small, less blood will leave. That was the first step. The second step that happened was that we had a platelet plug that formed. Now remember what we said about this. This platelet plug will work fine for smaller vesicles. But for the larger ones, it doesn't work. It won't work. It doesn't work very well at all. Actually, even for the smaller vesicles, this is not very stable. Platelet plugs, they're not very stable, which is why we need this third step, coagulation. So what happens over here in the third step is that you make that this repair much more stronger, and it's going to be, it's going to test, uh, it's going to pass the test of time. So think of it this way. Uh, let me give you an analogy. If you end up getting a hole in a tire, you have a few options. Uh, the first option is you can go get a brand new tire, all right? It's very, extremely expensive, so, you know, it's, uh, it's cross-prohibitive. Prohibitive. Second option you have is to take a plug and put a plug into that hole, wherever the hole may be. And the third option is to put a patch. So what they end up doing is they take the tire off of the rim, they find the hole, and they take a, a gel or glue, and they spread it uh, over the area where the hole is. Then they take a patch, a rubber patch, and they put it on top of the, the hole. And that, once they do that, 
the attire is good as new. All right, so those are the three options. So think of that when they put a patch as this step over here, as this coagulation. It's a very stable fix for it. Uh, it's very strong. So essentially what's happening is this, in coagulation, we have a hole and we need to fix it. We need to plug it up and we need to make sure that it's going to be nice and strong. This is how it gets done. All right, so let's go over what's going on. Let's go over this slide. So remember, what we're doing is we're taking this weak and unstable platelet plug and we're going to be reinforcing it with fibrin threads, which are going to be acting like a glue. The resulting blood clot or the fibrin mesh is very effective in seeing large blood vessel breaks. And in order to achieve this, blood gets transformed from a liquid to a gel in a multi-step process which involves a series of substances called clotting factors or procoagulants, which are mostly plasma proteins. And most of these plasma proteins, they're made by the liver. The clotting factors are numbered from 1 to 13, based on the order of their discovery, not the reaction sequence. And with the exception of tissue factor, they all circulate in the active form until they are mobilized. And though vitamin K is not directly involved in coagulation, it is required to synthesize four clotting factors, which are factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. Coagulation occurs in three phases. In phase one, the ultimate goal is to get to prothrombin activator. And this is initiated either by intrinsic or extrinsic pathways, but usually both. And it's triggered by tissue damage. And now this damage could be either within the blood vessels or it could be extravascular tissue damage. The pathway to prothrombin activator involves a series of procoagulants. Each one of these pathways cascades towards the end with the activation of factor 10. Factor 10 then complexes with calcium ions, platelet factor 3, and factor 5 to form prothrombin activator, which is the final product of phase 1. The intrinsic pathway is called intrinsic because the clotting factors are present within the blood, and they're triggered by negatively charged surfaces such as the activated platelets, or the collagen fibers from the broken vessel, or when the blood is taken out of the body, glass, such as the glass two test tubes that they use to collect the blood. In the extrinsic pathway, it's called extrinsic because factors that are needed for clotting are located outside the blood. And this is triggered by exposure to tissue factor, which is also called factor three. And it bypasses several steps of the intrinsic pathway, which makes the extrinsic pathway much faster than the intrinsic. This can happen in seconds, whereas this pathway takes minutes. This slide over here shows the first phase, and it's showing both the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathways, and all the cofactors that are required to go all the way down to prothrombin activator. I find this a little bit confusing, so I made my own flowchart, so let's go and take a look at that. All right, so this slide over here, what I did is I listed intrinsic and extrinsic pathways, and I'm trying to show you that from starting over here at both of these pathways, eventually we want this fibrin mesh to be produced. So remember we said there is three phases. So this is the first phase over here. Okay, up to here is the first phase. Then this is the second phase. And then this is all the third phase. So let's go over this from, this, uh, from the top all the way down to the bottom over here. So remember, intrinsic and extrinsic pathways, they're both going to lead to prothrombin activator. And prothrombin activator, with the help of calcium ions, is going to activate prothrombin into thrombin. Thrombin, then, will activate fibrinogen, which is soluble, into insoluble fibrin monomers. So these fibrin monomers are useless. What we need are fibrin polymers. So how do we get to fibrin polymers? This is what happens. Thrombin will come and activate factor 13 to factor 13A. Remember, whenever you see the subscript, uh, a, that means it's the active form. So factor 13A, along with calcium, activates or it'll take fibrin monomers and convert them into fibrin polymers. Now we actually have this fibrin mesh that forms or this fibrin polymer clot. All right, now let's get to both the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathways. So let's start off with the extrinsic pathway. Before we get there, so notice we have all these, these uh, uh, factors listed over here, factor 12, factor 11, factor 9, and then on the other side, you, you see the same thing, factor 12, but with this subscript A. Whenever you see this subscript A, that means this is the active form of the factor. So this is factor 12, this is factor, this is active, activated factor 12. So this is factor 11, factor 11 is activated now, okay, activated factor 11. 
So let's go over here at the extrinsic pathway. So this starts off with trauma to the extravascular tissue or to the vascular wall, which causes the release of tissue factors, which is also known as tissue thromboplastin. Now, this tissue factor will activate factor 7 to factor 7A. Now, factor 7A, with the addition of calcium ions and tissue factor, then activates factor 10 to factor 10A. Okay, so this is it for the extrinsic path, uh, pathway. Very fast, it goes from tissue factor from here to here, boom, boom, boom. So this happens very quickly, within seconds. Now, let's go to the intr intrinsic pathway. The intrinsic pathway, trauma to the endothelium, it exposes blood cells to collagen. Now, collagen, remember, it's negatively charged. So for the intrinsic pathway, remember what we said, we need the activation needs to be kicked off by something negative, so a negative charge. So this could be glass. The Remember, glass is uh, negatively charged. Uh, it could be that, or it could be the, the surface of the platelets, which are also negatively charged. It's going to activate factor 12. So now, factor 12 gets activated into 12A. All right, this is the active form of factor 12. Factor 12A, with the addition of high molecular weight kininogens, will activate factor 11 to factor 11A. Now, factor 11A, with the addition of calcium, will activate factor 9 into factor 9A. Now, factor 9A, with the addition of factor 8A, remember, factor 8 gets activated into factor 8A. Now, factor 8A, along with factor 9A, will activate factor 10. Factor 10A, now, along with the addition of factor 5A, calcium ions, and platelet factor 3, will activate prothrombin into thrombin. Now, up to here, this is all phase 1, okay? Now, even over here, uh, at this ex extrinsic pathway, when we get to this formation of factor 10A, that's it for phase 1, all right? Now, this is phase 2 over here. Phase 2, prothrombin will activate thrombin. This is it for phase 2. Now what happens is thrombin will activate fibrinogen, okay, which is soluble into insoluble fibrin monomers. Now, these insoluble fibrin monomers, remember what I told you, they're useless. We need fibrin polymers. So what ends up happening is thrombin will activate factor 13 to factor 13A, and with the addition of calcium ions, these fibrin monomers will be activated into fibrin polymers. And this is how you end up getting this fibrin mesh. And phase two, which is a common pathway to thrombin, what happens here, as we saw already, is that prothrombin activator will transform prothrombin into the active enzyme thrombin. And in this slide here, you want to pay attention to phase two, where prothrombin activator will convert prothrombin into thrombin. And phase three is a common pathway to the fibrin mesh. And over here is when thrombin will convert this soluble fibrinogen into insoluble fibrin. And these fibrin strands will form the structural basis of the clot. Fibrin makes the plasma to become more gel-like, and it traps the formed elements that are passing by. However, remember, what's go all going on over here is that thrombin will just convert that fibrin into these fibrin monomers. We need these fibrin polymers. So over here, thrombin, along with calcium, is going to activate factor 13 to factor 13A into active factor 13. And this is going to be stabilizing these fibrin molecules into these fibrin polymers. It forms these covalent bonds between the fibrin molecules. And it strengthens and stabilizes the clot. Anticoagulants, these are factors that normally dominate in the blood to inhibit coagulation. But when there's damage to a tissue, to a vessel, the balance of the anticoagulants to coagulants changes. So in the area where the damage is, now we have a lot more clotting factors that are active and not as much anticoagulants. So this is what allows for the coagulation to occur. Normally, again, we have a lot more anticoagulants going around. Anticoagulants can also be administered as drugs. So you may have heard of uh, drugs like such as heparin, warfarin. These are examples of anticoagulants. And in this slide here, you can see that thrombin will convert fibrinogen, which is soluble, into insoluble fibrin. And with the addition of thrombin and calcium, the factor 13 will get converted into factor 13A, and this is what forms these fibrin monomers into fibrin polymers to form this fibrin mesh. This slide here is just illustrating the three phases. So in phase one, remember, regardless of intrinsic or extrinsic pathway, the goal is to get to prothrombin activator. Now, once we have 
prothrombin activator. In phase two, what's happening is this prothrombin activator is transforming prothrombin into thrombin. Now in phase three, thrombin will convert soluble fibrinogen into insoluble fibrin monomers. Now thrombin along with calcium will convert factor 13 into the active form. Now factor 13A will convert these fibrin monomers into fibrin polymers. And this is when we end up getting this fibrin mesh to be formed. In this slide here, we're looking at a scanning electron micrograph, and you can see this fibrin mesh that's over here. And within this fibrin mesh, you can see all the red blood cells that are trapped. In this slide here, we have a table that lists all the blood clotting factors, so these procoagulants. So on the first column over here on the left, we have these factor numbers. So factor one, factor two, factor three. Next to that, we have the names of the factor. So factor one is fibrinogen, factor two is prothrombin, factor three is tissue factor, and so on. In the third column, what's the nature of them? So fibrinogen, for example, is a plasma protein. Prothrombin is also a plasma protein. Calcium is an inorganic ion. Next column over here lists the source. The bulk of these, the majority, are all produced by the liver. The last column over here, it tells you its function or the pathway. So you can see that fibrinogen, common pathway, and it gets converted into fibrin. Um, factor 3, okay, tissue factor, this activates the extrinsic pathway. The last column over here will state the pathway and the function. So for factor 1, fibrinogen, this is part of the common pathway, and it gets converted into fibrin. For factor 2, this is also part of the common pathway, and this gets converted into thrombin. So uh, be sure to go over the remainder of this table and study it. So a question that I get asked frequently is, do I have to memorize this table? And the short answer to it is, ask your professor. All right. It depends on your professor. If they want you to memorize this, if they want you to know it, then you need to know it. If they don't, then you're off the hook. Uh, do you need to know this at the undergrad level? I would say no, probably not. When you get into nursing school, when you get into uh, medical school or PA school, at that point, you better know this stuff. So if you, it's good to understand this. You don't have to worry about memorizing these too much right now. But again, when you get to your advanced courses, at that point, you will need to know these. Moving on to clot retraction and fibrinolysis. Anywhere from a half an hour to an hour, the clot gets further stabilized by a platelet-induced reaction called clot retraction. The platelets in the clot contain actin and myosin. If you remember, these are proteins we also find in muscle tissue. So as these proteins contract, they pull on the fibrin strands, squeezing out serum from the mass, and it pulls the edges of the broken vessels closer together for repair. And when you go back to this term over here, serum, serum is just plasma minus the clotting proteins. Even as the clot retraction is occurring, the vessel continues to heal. Platelet-derived growth factors, which are released by platelets, stimulates the smooth muscle cells and fibroblasts to rebuild the blood vessel walls. As the fibroblasts form a connective tissue patch in the injured area, Vascular endothelial growth factors, which is also known by its acronym VEGF, stimulates endothelial cells to multiply and restore the endothelial lining. Once the damage area is repaired, it's through the process of fibrinolysis that clots are removed. This is very important because small clots are continually being formed. Even right now as you're all sitting, some vessel in your body just had an injury. Again, this is normal. It's a part of wear and tear or it could be from trauma. So if you think about the thousands of miles of blood vessels we have in our body and all of the clots that are formed, if we didn't remove these clots, the blood vessels would become completely blocked. Fibrinolysis begins within two days and continues for several days until the clot is dissolved. The fibrin digesting enzyme of our body is called plasmin. Think of this as our body's own clot buster. Plasmin is an active form of the plasma protein plasminogen. Plasminogen gets incorporated into a forming clot where it sits and waits for the activation signals to reach. The presence of a clot around a blood vessel causes the endothelial cells to secrete tissue plasminogen activator, which is also known by its acronym TPA. TPA, along with activator factor 12 and thrombin, all serve as plasminogen activators. Moving on to disorders of hemostasis, we have two major types of disorders, thromboembolic disorders and bleeding disorders. Thromboembolic disorders result in undesirable clot formation, whereas the bleeding disorders, these are abnormalities that prevent the normal clot formation from taking place. Disseminated intravascular coagulation, or DIC, involves both of these types of disorders. For the thromboembolic conditions, we have thrombi and emboli. 
A thrombus is a clot that develops and persists in an unbroken vessel. A thrombus is stationary, it's not moving anywhere. And it may block circulation depending on how large that clot is and the size of the blood vessel. So if it is blocking circulation, it could lead to tissue death. An embolus on the other hand, it's a thrombus that's moving about. It's freely floating in the bloodstream. Embolism is an embolus that's obstructing a blood vessel. So the examples they give you are pulmonary or cerebral emboli. So this would be in the lung and this would be in the brain. Risk factors include atherosclerosis, inflammation, slow flowing blood, or blood stasis from immobility. So if you have a very long flight, again, you're going to Europe, transatlantic flight or trans-Pacific flight, uh, or again, even then, if you're just going for a very long drive uh, on the road, uh, or if you're bedridden, you have a higher risk for developing a thrombus or an embolus. In addition to that, if you have very high cholesterol, you're a smoker, uh, again, you have a, you know, you're just generally unhealthy. So these conditions, you, you, you end up having atherosclerosis and inflammation. So these are all risk factors for developing a uh, thrombus or an embolus. Anticoagulants are drugs that are used to prevent undesirable clotting. Aspirin is the antiprostaglandin drug that inhibits thromboxin A2 formation. What it does is that it blocks platelets from aggregating and platelet plugs from forming. Both heparin and warfarin are anticoagulant prescription drugs. Heparin is injected to inpatients both pre- and post-operatively who are undergoing some type of cardiac care in addition to those receiving blood transfusions. Coumadin or warfarin is used for outpatients to reduce the risk of a stroke in those patients prone to atrial fibrillation. The mechanism it works is different than that of heparin. Warfarin interferes with the activation of vitamin K in some procoagulants. Dibigatrin is another oral anticoagulant that directly inhibits thrombin. It's sometimes used as an alternative to warfarin. Thrombocytopenia is a deficiency in the number of circulating platelets. So when you look at this term, thrombocytopenia, penia means deficiency, cyte means cell, thrombo means clot. So you're looking at a deficiency in the cells that clot, or in other words, platelets. So when you have this condition, you have widespread bleeding throughout the body, and you end up getting these petechia that appear. These are these pinpoint hemorrhages. And this happens, thrombocytopenia, from anything that could be destroying the red bone marrow. So for example, some malignancy, or it could be due to radiation, or even certain drugs will end up destroying the red bone marrow. When your platelet count is less than 50,000 cells per microliter of blood, this is the diagnosis for thrombocytopenia. And it's treated by giving the patient a transfusion of concentrated platelets. Another condition that can lead to bleeding disorders is an impaired liver function. If you remember, your liver produces most of the plasma proteins in addition to a lot of the clotting factors or these procoagulants. Now, what can cause an impaired liver function? This could be due to not enough vitamin K or it could be because of hepatitis or cirrhosis. Now, dietary vitamin K deficiency is seldom a problem because the bacteria that lives in your large intestines produces enough vitamin K and then your body is able to absorb that. However, the issue could be this. If you have liver disease, such as hepatitis or cirrhosis, your body is not going to be producing enough bile, and bile is needed to absorb vitamin K. Bile absorbs fat. Vitamin K is a fat-soluble vitamin. So if you don't have enough bile, then you're not going to be able to absorb vitamin K. And this is going to be a problem in producing these clotting factors. Hemophilia refers to several different hereditary bleeding disorders that have similar signs and symptoms. Hemophilia A, which is also known as classical hemophilia, is the most common type, accounting for about 77% of all cases. It results from a deficiency of factor 8, which is also known as antihemophilic factor. Hemophilia B results from a deficiency of factor 9. And like hemophilia A, this is also an X-linked condition, which affects males. Hemophilia C, which is due to a deficiency of factor 11, is a less severe form of hemophilia and is found in both sexes. Symptoms include prolonged bleeding into tissue which could become life-threatening. Repeated bleeding into the joint cavities is quite common, causing disability and severe pain. In the past, treatment included plasma transfusion or injections of the clotting factor, but now genetically engineered factors are administered, which also eliminates the risk of HIV and hepatitis infection. DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation involves both widespread clotting and severe bleeding. 
The widespread clotting occurs in intact blood vessels blocking blood flow and the severe bleeding follows because residual blood is unable to clot because the clotting factors are being depleted. This can occur in septicemia, incompatible blood transfusions, or complications in pregnancy. The cardiovascular system in the human body is designed to minimize the effects of blood loss by reducing the volume of the affected blood vessels and stepping up the production of red blood cells. But your body can compensate for only so much blood loss. When you lose between 15 to 30 percent of blood, this causes pallor, which means your body starts turning pale, and generalized weakness. And if one were to lose more than 30 percent of their blood volume, it could result in a potentially fatal, severe shock. When it comes to blood transfusions, whole blood transfusions are rarely used. It's only used when somebody loses a lot of blood. So when they have rapid blood loss or a substantial quantity of blood that's lost, this is when whole blood transfusions are used. Aside from that, what gets done is the patient usually ends up getting only what they need. So for example, if somebody just needs red blood cell, then they get an infusion of packed red blood cells or PRBCs. And all this is is just plasma and the white blood cells removed. And this is preferred to restore oxygen carrying capacity. Blood banks, they'll usually separate this donated blood into the components. And the reason they do this is so people can get what they need. In other words, you don't need to give somebody everything. Because chances are some people just need white blood cells. They may not need red blood cells. Or some people may just need certain blood plasmas, uh, some of the plasma proteins. So this is what the blood banks will do. They'll separate the different components. Now the shelf life of blood is about 35 days when it's stored at about 4 degrees Celsius. Because of the ABO blood typing, human blood groups of the donated blood has to be determined before a transfusion is given. Otherwise, you can have fatal reactions. On the surface of a red blood cell, it has this highly specific glycoprotein ion, which is called an antigen. The antigen serves to identify this red blood cell to this person's body. And an antigen is defined as anything that's perceived as foreign that can generate an immune response. Red blood cells antigens are referred to as agglutinogens. Now an agglutinogen, which means clumping. This is called clumping because if you were to receive red blood cells from somebody else, which are not the same as yours, those red blood cells will start to clump or agglutinate. So this is why uh, these antigens on the red blood cells are referred to as agglutinogens. Now these mismatched blood cells from this transfusion that someone may have received will be agglutinated and destroyed. And this could be a potentially fatal reaction. Humans have at least 30 naturally occurring red blood cell antigens. And the presence or absence of each antigen is used to classify blood cells into the different groups. Some blood groups such as the MNS, the Kell, the Duffy, and Lewis are only weak agglutinogens, so they're not really typed. They have more of a legal and academic importance. Unless someone's expected to have multiple transfusions, they will type for this because these smaller reactions could have a cumulative effect. The antigens of the ABO and RH blood groups are the ones that can cause the most vigorous transfusion reactions. And these are the major groups that are typed. The ABO blood group is based on the presence or absence of two agglutinogens, the A and the B on the surface of the red blood cell. Type A has only A agglutinogen. Type B has only B agglutinogen. Type AB has both A and B agglutinogens. And type O has neither A nor B agglutinogens. Blood may also contain preformed anti-A or anti-B antibodies, which are called agglutinins. And they act against transfused red blood cells with ABO antigens that are not present on the recipient's red blood cell. And these anti-A or anti-B agglutinins, they form in blood at about 2 months of age. And they reach their adult levels by 8 to 10 years of age. Alright, so this slide over here is a very good study table that goes over the ABO blood group. So let's go over this. And so we have here the blood type on this column over here all the way on the left. The next column goes over the antigen that's present on the red blood cell. And then the third column over here, it states whether there is an antibody present or not. Now, please make sure you know the terms. The antigen is also referred to as the agglutinogen. 
And the antibody is also referred to as the agglutinin. Okay, agglutinin and agglutinogen. Now, moving along, over here, this will tell you blood that can be received over here. So, uh, and then we're going to go over all these. And then finally, it tells you what the frequency is in the population of the United States. Um, so, depending on which part of the world you are, these numbers will vary, of course. So, when you go over here and you look over here, if you have blood group AB, then on the surface of your red blood cell, you have both A and B agglutinogens, okay? Or, in other words, you have both the A and the B antigens. But in the plasma, in your blood plasma, you have no antibodies, all right? And now I'm going to come to this column later. Let's go over this because you'll understand this. If you can understand this, then you don't have to worry about this. This will make sense to you. If you have type B blood, then on the surface of your red blood cell, you have B antigens or the B agglutinogens. In your plasma, you have anti-A antibodies or anti-A agglutinins. If you have type A blood, then on the surface of your red blood cell, you have type A antigens or type A agglutinogens. And in your plasma, you have anti-B antibodies. Now, if you have type O blood group, then you have no antigens on the surface of your red blood cell, okay? But in your plasma, you have both anti-A and anti-B antibodies. Now, let me try to make this a little bit more understanding to you about who can get blood and who cannot. Now, remember, what are these antibodies doing? They go and fight against anything that's not themselves. So if you have type B blood, then your body doesn't want type A. So what do you have? You have antibodies that are fighting for type A. And these are what these are. These are anti-A antibodies. If you have type A blood, what type of antigen do you have? Of course, you have the A antigens. So who do you not want? You don't want the B. So you have these anti-B antibodies. Now, if you have both type A and type B, who are you fighting? You're fighting nobody. So you, you don't have any antibodies. However, when you go all the way down over here to type O, type O has no antigens. You're fighting everybody, so you have both anti-A and anti-B antibodies. All right? So hopefully that makes sense to you. So now, if you think about this, who can give blood and who can receive blood? So let's look at it over here. If you have type O blood, you can only get blood from O, okay? Because you are the universal donor. You can give blood to anybody because you have no antigens. If you have no antigens, then guess what? It doesn't make a difference. If you have an A antibody or a B antibody, there's nothing to fight down to. There's no identification marker. Let's just put it like that. So there's no antigen present. So these anti-B and anti-A antibodies, they can't attack this red blood cell. So you're the universal donor. If you have type O, you are the universal donor. If you have type A blood, then you can receive blood from A and you can receive blood from O. Remember, O is the universal donor. O has no antigens. So if O comes to you, remember you have anti-B antibodies. Are your antibodies going to be able to attack some red blood cells that have absolutely no antigens on them? Absolutely not. So you can get blood from O and you can also get blood from A, right? A, you have A, so you're gonna, you can get more of what you have. If you have type B blood, then you can get blood from type B in addition to type O. Remember, O is a universal donor. Everyone can get O. And if you're type AB blood, then remember, you have both A and B antigens on the surface of your red blood cell. So you can get blood from A, you can get blood from B, in addition to O, and of course AB. Remember, you have no antibodies if you're type AB. Because you have no antibodies, you're not going to be attacking anybody, you're not going to be fighting. You're going to be loving everybody, so you're getting blood from everyone. So looking at the frequencies, for type AB, 4% whites, 4% blacks, 7% Asian, 2% Hispanic, and less than 1% of Native Americans. Type B, you have 11% white, 19% black, 25% Asians, 10% Hispanic, and 4% Native American. For type A, we have 40% white, 26% black, 28% Asian, 31% Hispanic, and 16% Native American. 
And for type O, 45% white, 51% black, 40% Asian, 57% Hispanic, and 79% Native American. I don't think you have to memorize this. Again, ask your professor if you, they want you to memorize uh, the percentage of the, in, of the U.S. population. But you can't expect all these on an exam. This is something that you absolutely need to know. So again, very quickly, if you have type A blood, whatever type blood you have, that's the antigen that you have. So if you have type A blood, then you have A antigen. If you have type B blood, then you have type B antigen. If you have type AB blood, then you have both A and B antigen. And as for type O, of course, O, think of it as zero. That means you have no antigens on your red blood cell. Now, which antibody? How do you remember that? Well, if you have type A, then which one are you fighting? B, of course. So then you have type B. If you have type B, then what's the opposite of B? A. You're against A. If you have both A and B, then you have none. Okay, because remember, type AB is also the universal recipient. In order for them to get everything, remember, they love everybody. They don't fight. So they, have any, they don't have any antibodies. Type O, on the other hand, they fight both A and B, okay? So you're going to have both A and B, anti-A and anti-B antibodies. At the time this text was written back in 2015, there were 52 different types of RHA glutenogens, each of which are called RH factors. And out of all of these, only three are common, which are the C, D, and E factors. About 85% of Americans are RH positive, which indicates the presence of the D factor. The reason for the naming of RH is because the D antigen was first discovered in a rhesus monkey and later in humans. Now the RH factors are different from the ABO system antibodies in that the anti-RH antibodies are not spontaneously formed in the blood of RH negative individuals. And it's only when an RH negative individual receives RH positive blood or if a RH negative mother is carrying an RH positive fetus that the person will start producing anti-RH antibodies shortly after the transfusion or after the delivery of the fetus. So the second exposure to RH positive blood will result in a reaction where the recipient's or mother's antibodies will attack the donor's or fetus's red blood cells. Erythroblastosis fetalis, which is also called hemolytic disease of newborn, only occurs in RH negative mothers with an RH positive fetus. The first pregnancy will usually result with the delivery of a healthy baby, but when bleeding occurs when the placenta separates from the uterus, the RH negative mother may become sensitized to the RH positive baby's antigens that pass into her bloodstream. If this happens, then she'll start forming anti-RH antibodies, unless she's treated with Rogam before or shortly after she's given birth. Rogam is a serum containing anti-RH agglutinins, so by agglutinating the RH factor, it blocks the mother's immune response and prevents her sensitization. In the second pregnancy, if the RH negative mother is not treated, her antibodies will cross through the placenta and destroy the baby's red blood cells. The baby becomes anemic and hypoxic. In severe cases, brain damage and death could result unless transfusions are done before birth to give the fetus more erythrocytes for oxygen transport. And postpartum, or after birth, an additional one or two exchanges of transfusions are done. The baby's RH positive blood is removed and RH negative blood is infused. Usually within six weeks, the transfused RH negative red blood cells get broken down and replaced by the baby's own RH positive cells. Transfusion reactions occur if mismatched blood is infused. What happens is that the donor cells are attacked by the recipient's plasma agglutinins. Initially, this agglutination of the foreign red blood cells clogs small blood vessels throughout the body. Then after a few hours, the clumped red blood cells begin rupturing or destroyed by phagocytes and their hemoglobin gets released into the bloodstream. This leads to several problems, such as the diminished oxygen carrying capability of the infused cells. The small blood vessels where the cells are clumping will have a limited flow of blood or be completely blocked, depriving oxygen and nutrients to the tissues being served beyond that point. Additionally, the escaped hemoglobin from the ruptured cells that's in the bloodstream passes freely into the kidney tubules, causing cell death and renal failure. If it leads to acute renal failure, the person may die. Transition reactions may lead to fever, chills, low blood pressure, a rapid heartbeat, nausea and vomiting, and general toxicity. The treatment of transfusion reactions is directed at preventing kidney damage by administering fluid and diuretics to increase urine output in addition to diluting and washing out the hemoglobin. As we learned several slides ago, individuals with type O blood lack both A and B agglutinogens. Remember, agglutinogens and antigens are the same thing, it's just a different term. So theoretically, type O blood is said to be the universal donor. Theoretically, they can donate blood to any of the ABO blood groups. Why? 
Again, because their red blood cells lack the A and B antigens. And someone with type AB blood does not have the anti-A or anti-B antibodies. So they are theoretically universal recipients, meaning they can theoretically receive blood from any of the ABO blood groups. Why? Because they do not have the anti-A or anti-B antibodies. The issue with the universal donor and universal recipient claim is that it's misleading, as they're not taking into account any of the other agglutinogens that can cause a transfusion reaction. So with the risk of transfusion reactions and transmission of infections such as HIV and hepatitis from pool transfusion, there's been an increase in autologous transfusions, and particularly those that are planning on undergoing elective surgery such as cosmetic surgery. So what happens here is that the patient has their own blood drawn and stored anywhere from 2 to 3 weeks before the surgery, but they can still have their blood drawn up to 72 hours prior to the surgery. Usually they take out about a half a liter of blood every 4 days, and a lot of times, the doctor will prescribe iron supplements so that it's readily available for the body as they'll start producing new red blood cells to replace the loss. And then if during or after the surgery the patient needs blood, they'll get their own blood transfused back to them. Before blood's transfused, it's detrimental to determine the blood group of both the donor and recipient. The donor's blood is mixed with the antibodies against the common agglutinogens, and if an agglutinogen is present, clumping will occur. And we type blood for the ABO group the same way we do for the RH factor. A cross-matching is also done to type between a specific donor and a specific recipient. So in a cross-matching, we're testing for agglutination of the donor's red blood cells by the recipient's serum, and the recipient's red blood cells by the donor's serum. So in this side over here, they're showing you the ABO blood types being tested. So on this side over here, we have the anti-A antibodies, and on this side over here, we have the anti-B antibodies. So let's go all the way down over here to type O blood. Now remember, for people, for in, in individuals that have type O blood, on their red blood cells, they do not have any antigens. So there's no A antigen, nor is there any B antigen. So what happens when you expose them to anti-A antibodies or anti-B antibodies? And the answer is absolutely nothing. There's no antigen on the red blood cells. How can these antibodies react? So nothing will happen. Now going to people with type B. Type B blood, what type of antigen do they have on the surface of the red blood cells? They have... B antigens. If they have B antigens, that means in their plasma they have the anti-A antibodies. So now what's going to happen? The anti-A antibodies, they have them already. So absolutely nothing's going to happen, right? Anti-A antibodies are not going to come and attack the, uh, the, the B antigens. Remember, they're against the A antigens. Now the anti-B antibodies, on the other hand, they're going to come and start attacking the B antigens. So this is why you're going to start to seeing clumping of the red blood cells over here. Go on to the type A blood now. Remember, if you have type A blood, what do we have? On the surface of your red blood cells, you have the A antigens, meaning you have in your plasma the anti-B antibodies. So now what do we expect? Over here, the anti-A antibody, what are they going to do? They're going to come and attack the A antigens. So you're going to start seeing clumping take place of the red blood cells. But for anti-B, you're going to have absolutely no reaction. Okay? Now we come up to the type AB blood. Remember, type AB blood, they have both the A and the B antigens on the surface of their red blood cell. And what do they have? What do they not have? They do not have any anti-A or anti-B antibodies in their plasma. So when you introduce the anti-A and anti-B antibodies, guess what's going to happen? It's going to start clumping. Okay, so both, you're going to get a reaction on both ends. Therefore, that means you have type AB blood. So, be sure you understand this concept. Chances are, you will probably have a handful of questions on the exam about this. Uh, maybe not a handful, but you know, you'll, you, you may, you probably will have some questions about this. So, remember, this actually, concept is actually quite simple. Remember, whatever type blood you have, so if you have type A blood, that's the type of antigen you're going to find on the surface of the red blood cell. So again, type A blood, you have A antigens. Type B blood, you have B antigens. Type O or 0, you have no kind of antigens on the surface of the red blood cell. If you have type AB, then you have both A and B. Now remember, as for the antibodies, whatever type blood you have, the opposite is what you're going to have for the antibodies in the plasma. So if you have type A blood, then you're going to have the anti-B antibodies. If you have type B blood, then you're going to have the type A antibodies. If you have type O blood, then guess what? You have both A and B antibodies. But if you have type AB blood, then you do not have any 
of the anti-A or the anti-B antibodies. So, and remember, what do these antibodies do? They go and they start clumping the antibody, that the, the antigen that they're after. So, in the case of the anti-B antibody, they're going to be looking for the B antigens. The type for the A anti antibodies, they're going to be looking for the A antigens. Which is why when you see over here, when you administer, when you put a drop of the anti-A antibody on somebody that has type A blood, it's going to start clumping these A antigen red blood cells. Whereas if you start, um, take a drop of the anti-B antibody and you place it on a red blood cell, nothing happens. Why? Because there is no B antigens on the surface of the red blood cell. So hopefully this made sense to you. Please be sure you understand that. Again, rewind this a couple times if you don't. Uh, understand it the first time. Hopefully it'll kick into you uh, the second time or the third time. And if you still have questions, please feel free to email me. Or again, leave it in the comments below. Maybe somebody can answer it for you. When a patient's blood volume is too low, the term to describe this is hypovolemia. Hypovolemia can lead to shock called hypovolemic shock. And the patient can die from this. This is a life-threatening emergency. And these type of emergencies requires an immediate replacement of blood volume. Now keep in mind that loss of blood can happen very quickly, so fast that there may not be time to type blood or there may not be any availability of whole blood. So you may remember seeing movies or news clips of paramedics rushing to someone who has lost blood, possibly from a gunshot or some other type of trauma. And you'll see the paramedics have a bag of fluids hanging high, which they're administering intravenously. So what they're doing is that they're replacing the blood loss with normal saline or a multiple electrolyte solution, which mimics the electrolyte composition of plasma. And the reason this works is because as we now know, blood is made up of proteins and cells that are suspended in a salt solution. So all that's happening is that we're replacing the volume, which will restore adequate circulation, but it'll do nothing to replace the oxygen carrying capacities of the red blood cells. Moving on to diagnostic blood tests. Examination of blood can give us a lot of information about an individual's health status. So for example, a low hematocrit can be seen in cases of anemia. Also blood glucose tests. This can tell us if someone has diabetes or not. If we get end up seeing leukocytosis, this can be an indication of infection. Also microscopic examinations of blood can give us information on the variations in size or shape of red blood cells. An abnormal size, shape, or color could indicate anemia. When looking at a differential white blood cell count or a diff, we're looking at the relative proportions of each white blood cell. And increases in specific white blood cells can help us with a diagnosis. So for example, if somebody has a high eosinophil count, we can say, oh yeah, you know, this could be a parasitic infection. Prothrombin times and platelet counts also help assess hemostasis. So again, this could be useful in individuals that are receiving blood thinners. Uh, Comprehensive metabolic panels, okay, or CMPs. This will tell an individual's entire blood chemistry profile. And again, it's going to check for various blood chemical levels like calcium. Um, you can check for uh, the uh, liver enzymes also that, that could be a part of this. Um, and, and even cholesterol levels. Abnormal results could indicate, again, liver problems, kidney problems, again, cholesterol issues, whatever the panel is testing for. So again, depending on uh, which hospital you're at, each or which lab uh, is doing it, they'll have their own set of uh, chemicals that they're looking for under each panel. So some uh, hospitals or some labs will have a panel that tests for seven chemicals. So that's called like a Chem 7 or a Chem 11 or a Chem 21. Uh, so again, it varies from hospital to hospital, lab to lab. A CBC or a complete blood count checks for all the formed elements. And this also includes the hematocrit and hemoglobin levels. So again, it, this is going to give you what your red blood cell count is, what your white blood cell count is, what your platelet count is. And this helps the doctor figure out what's going on with your body. Are you overall healthy or not? Are you fighting infection? Are you anemic? So again, this is a very useful test. Again, if you go for an annual physical, this is one of the things that they'll look at. Also, if you're complaining of, you know, oh, I'm not feeling good, or if you have a fever, they'll probably also run a CBC. Early on in fetal development, blood cells form at several sites, including the fetal yolk sac, liver, and spleen. But by the seventh month, the red bone marrow becomes the primary hemopoietic area and remains so throughout life. However, if there's a severe need for red blood cells, the liver and spleen could start producing again, in addition to inactive yellow bone marrow, which could reconvert to active red bone marrow. Blood cells develop from mesenchymal cells called blood ions, which are derived from the mesoderm germ layer. 
The fetus will form a unique hemoglobin called hemoglobin F, which has a high affinity for oxygen than does adult hemoglobin, which is called hemoglobin A. After birth, the hemoglobin F is destroyed by the liver and the baby starts producing hemoglobin A. When looking at blood diseases of the aging, chronic leukemias, anemias, and clotting disorders are the most common, and they're usually precipitated by disorders of the heart, blood vessels, or immune system. And that's it for chapter 17. Thank you so much for watching this. If you like the video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. Also, please be sure to share with your friends, your classmates, your instructors, anybody who you think may find it helpful. As always, if you have any questions, please email me or you can leave the questions in the comments below. Again, thank you so much for watching and best of luck.